I hope you're all staying safe and uh, finding ways to be happy, even under constricted circumstances. Uh, this is a lecture about negative interest rates. I've mentioned it a lot as part of the argument that the Fed can put aggregate demand at any level needed by the economy, uh, which, which then is, is the principle of monetary dominance. Whatever's going on with fiscal policy, whatever is going on with other shocks to the economy, the Fed can choose where aggregate demand is. Now, getting aggregate demand right only does so much. It can't, uh, it can't make the, the pandemic go away. But once the pandemic is tamed from a medical and public health point of view, getting aggregate demand right is going to be pretty crucial to make sure there aren't bad act after effects to the economy. Uh, and, and even in an in-between situation where things are mostly under control, but people are still afraid that there'll be more lockdowns and so aren't investing and aren't hiring, then it could be very crucial to get a sufficient level of aggregate demand. If, if you need really low aggregate demand, raising interest rates is pretty straightforward, and the Fed's done that a lot, so it's very used to that. On the other hand, if you need more aggregate demand, you need lower interest rates, and then you might have to do the tr uh, traditionally unusual thing, or uh, the, the thing that hasn't been done a ton in the past of going to negative rates. So let's talk about that. Uh, let's talk about how and why to eliminate any lower bound on interest rates. And although the US hasn't gone to negative rates, many other countries have, Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden, the Eurozone, Japan, remember the Eurozone is uh, shared monetary policy uh, run by the European Central Bank. Uh, and it's shared by many, many countries of whom some of the biggest are are Germany, France, Italy, Spain. Um, those are, you know, many other countries in the Eurozone, but those are some of the bigger ones. So there's actually a remarkably large amount of, of government bonds out there in the world that are at negative interest rates. Now they, they don't have super big negative interest rates. Notice the lowest rate shown on this chart is minus minus 0.75, minus three quarters of a percent in Switzerland. So these aren't huge negative rates. You know, minus three quarters of a percent is the lowest, but, um, uh, but it's a lot of countries and it's a lot of government bonds running at those rates. And, and there are, uh, all, there are some, some mortgages that are at negative rates, so they're mostly adjustable rate mortgages, not, you know, you can't get a 30 year mortgage at negative rates uh, anywhere at this point, but you can get an adjustable rate mortgage at negative rates, or you have been able to in some of the past years. Okay, so, you know, negative rates that are pretty small negative rates are actually a very different animal than deep negative rates. Like, you know, minus three quarters of a percent is very different from minus four percent. So. Uh, there are several issues that can arise at rates below minus three quarters of a percent, but not at mild negative rates. You can get strains on bank profits. You can get large scale paper currency storage, uh, at least in theory. Let's talk about some of those issues in a minute. But first, I want to remind you something I spent a whole lecture on about how rate, cut work, uh, rate cuts work. This is the short version here. Rate cuts work in every corner of the economy to encourage investment and consumption spending, and actually even government purchases, both by shifting the balance of power in favor of those most apt to spend. You, you know, lower rates, are, lower rates are, are good for borrowers and bad for lenders, so they shift the balance in favor of, of borrowers who are especially good at spending. And, uh, in addition to shifting the balance of power in favor of borrowers who are good at spending, uh, lower rates give an incentive to spend. We talked about that. They just make it cheaper to spend now uh, in, in terms of what it's gonna cost you and in, in what you can spend later. Uh, the lower the interest rate is, the, the less you have to give up later to spend more now. 
And, uh, you know, one way of thinking about it is in the case of negative rates, the carrot for those for, who spend is coupled with a stick for those sitting on piles of cash that they resist putting to good use. You know, when you need people to spend because the economy is really hurting for more aggregate demand, really needs more aggregate demand, saving isn't such a virtue in that context. We're used to thinking of, of saving as a virtue uh, for, you know, in terms of spillovers for the whole country as well as for an individual, but the spillovers for the whole country from saving are actually negative when we desperately need more aggregate demand. And so we have to signal to people that, uh, that saving in a bad recession isn't quite as wonderful a thing as it is in normal times by having the negative interest rates. Now, how negative might we need to go? What, what you can see in this picture is uh, it's pretty normal to cut rates by five and a half percentage points historically. So a basis point is just a hundredth of a percentage point. So five and a half percentage points is 550 basis points. That's, that's pretty normal to cut rates by that much. But it, you know, if you start out with 2% per year, then a five and a half percentage point cut is gonna take you down to minus three and a half percent per year. So that's, a, that's, that's deep into the negative region if we did what's been historically normal to deal with a recession. And of course, we're in a weird situation now where the government's intentionally shutting down big chunks of the economy. But after the public health situation is over, then, uh, then we might well uh, need to go down as low as 3.5%. We don't really know. I mean, it could be that the economy just springs back on its own pretty well, or it could be that there some of the lingering after effects really call for big cuts to get aggregate demand to where it needs to, to go. Nobody really knows that. And uh, being prepared in case we need deep negative rates is, is definitely a wise thing. Okay, now there are three problems with deep negative rates. Now I wanna be upfront about these problems. There's a political problem, there's a bank profits problem, and a paper currency problem. Uh, let me just briefly mention what these are. The political problem is obvious. That's just some people will complain if there are negative rates. And I'll, I'll talk about various reasons why in a minute, but uh, you, you, you know that this will happen. You know that people will complain about negative rates, and you can see some complaints in the countries of, who have done even mild negative rates. Uh, the bank profits problem is basically this. Uh, when when, uh, the, when, when you cut interest rates, the banks are earning a lower interest rate on the loans that they make. And uh, if, uh, what, what happens if everything is starting out at positive rates is as, as what banks earn on the loans goes to lower rates, they cut their rates also on, that they pay on checking accounts and savings accounts. And the, the gap, the gap that allows uh, the, the gap that allows banks to to uh, you know make their profits can stay about the same. In fact, I'm going to put myself on screen here. Wait, where is the? This is weird. There we go. Let's go to start video. Okay, now you can you'll be able to see me uh, again, Spacey. So. Okay, so I, I did that partly so I could draw a picture of this gap. So, you know, normally, if what banks earn on loans comes down, the banks can also reduce what they pay on checking accounts and savings accounts and other deposit accounts. Uh, what happens when, uh, when though, when um, what you're paying on checking and savings accounts is already zero? Now, if what you learn, earn on loans goes down, the banks could, in theory, have negative rates on their checkings and savings accounts, but they think that's a customer relations problem. They think that looks really bad. So what you see in the countries that have mild negative rates is that the, the banks don't like, still don't want to reduce their 
what they still don't want to have negative rates on checking and savings accounts. They'll have a certain amount of other fees, but not, not things that are really per dollar that you have in the account. You've got to pay this much extra. Um, and so, so that's the big problem. The bank profits hurt because the banks uh, feel that it's dangerous to their customer relations to go to negative rates on their deposit accounts. So that's the source of the bank profits problem. Actually, other than that difficulty in lowering the rates on checking and savings accounts, there isn't a bank profits problem because everything else is, uh, is good for bank profits. You know, you, when, when, when rates go down, the, uh, the value of the, the, the loans that the banks have already made goes up. Uh, and, and that's, uh, you know, a bigger, that, that capital gains on their loans is a good effect and the economy getting in better shape is good for the banks and so on. So there are a lot of other good things for banks about negative rates, but the, the, what they're earning on loans going down or the new loans they make going down, uh, but ha ha feeling like it's very dangerous for customer relations to uh, go to negative rates on checking and savings accounts, that's the bank profits problem. And then the paper currency problem is, uh, Maybe people will say, wait, paper currency doesn't earn negative rates. Maybe I'll just store a lot of paper currency. Uh, that, that's a problem in a variety of ways. Uh, I'll, I'll emphasize other things later on, but you know, one, one thing is if trillions of dollars of paper currency were being stored, there'd just be a waste of social resources with all those, uh, those safes and, and storage, uh, storage units and so on. So, you know, it's not great if uh, large amounts of paper currency get stored, but we'll say more about that. Okay, what? Well, let's talk a bit about the political problem. Here are some sources of political opposition to negative rates. Uh, first of all, banks worry about things that haven't happened yet anywhere. So even at mild negative rates, banks are all worried. You know, in fact, their profits have not been hurt by the mild negative rates. Uh, but uh, banks are still complaining about negative rates because they're worried. Uh, there, there are some folks called monetary hawks. There's this interesting hawk and dove. You know, hawks are people who want higher rates, and doves are people who want lower rates in in monetary terminology. And so there are hawks who always think higher rates are good. So people who always think higher rates are good are kind of aghast at the idea of negative rates. Um, there are people who are afraid of negative rates just because they don't understand them. They say, how is that even possible? What is that? Now, I hope you by now know the answer to that and maybe stop the video and try to answer it. What is a negative interest rate? Okay, I'll give you my simple answer. You know, it's, it's typical for uh, the borrower to pay the lender for using money Negative rates are just when the lender is paying the borrower for storing their money. So, uh, you know, there was a time in history, in fact, it's reflected in many of the major religions, when people thought it was really horrible that borrowers had to pay lenders interest, you know. So there are rules in several major religions against paying interest, against lenders making borrowers pay interest. Uh, nowadays, we're used to that, but there was a time when people thought that was so awful that, uh, you know, any, any lender who would make a borrower pay interest would go to hell for it. Uh, and the, uh, but now we're used to borrowers paying lenders, but we're, many people are kind of think it's just awful if a lender should ever pay a borrower. You know, my, my view on that is turnabout is fair play. You know, borrowers have been paying lenders for many, many years. If, if the lenders have to pay the borrowers once in a while, uh, that's, that's, only, that's only fair. Of course, it isn't really fair because it's still going to be more often that the, uh, that the borrowers pay the lenders, and it's going to be fairly rare for the lenders to pay the borrowers. But, you know, a little of that isn't such a terrible thing in my view. Uh, and of course, there are people who want to save a lot, and so are natural lenders. You know, when, in my store, in my account of why I think cutting rates stimulates the economy, part of the story is that it's hard. You know, it's transferring power 
uh, from the uh, lender to the borrower. Lenders don't like that. So if you think that you're a lender, you, you wouldn't like cuts in rates. And you know, negative rates give you something a little more salient that you can point to and complain about. And you know, there are whole countries that are more savers than other countries on average. Germany is one of them. German, it, it, there really is truth to the idea that, 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 that Germans save more. And, you know, you can, you can ask why, and there's a, uh, you know, there's a potential cultural explanation there. It's kind of, it is, I, I wouldn't put too much stock in this, but it's kind of interesting that uh, in German, the word for debt is exactly the same as the word for guilt. It's uh, schuld. So schuld can mean in, you know, indebted or it can mean guilty. Well, if, if, if debt is like guilt, uh, that makes it sound pretty, pretty awful. Anyway, uh, Germans do save a lot. And given that they're savers, the idea of lower interest rates seems terribly unfair to them. Okay, now, in terms of the politics, there's a, a, a relatively recent development. I mean, you know, it might seem an eternity ago, ago before the coronavirus, but back in September of last year, less than, less than 12 months ago, uh, Donald Trump is saying the Federal Reserve should get our interest rates down to zero or less. Notice less would be negative rates. And we should then start to refinance our debt. Interest costs could be brought way down while at the same time substantially lengthening the term and so on and so forth. The USA should always be paying the lowest rate. No inflation. Uh, it's only the naivete of Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve that doesn't allow us to do what other countries are already doing. A once in a lifetime opportunity that we're missing because of boneheads. So uh, here he's calling anyone who's not willing to do negative rates a bonehead. Well, you know, I, it's not at all clear to me that we should have negative rates now or that we should have had negative rates back in September. But uh, we certainly should be prepared to have negative rates uh, after, after we're out of the immediate grips of this coronavirus uh, in, in case that's needed. Uh, here, here he is in a, in a tweet uh, one day later saying, praising the European Central Bank, saying it acted quickly, cuts rates 10 basis points. That's at one-tenth of one percentage point. They are trying and succeeding in depreciating the euro against the very strong dollar, hurting U.S. exports. And the Fed sits and sits and sits. They get paid to borrow money while we are paying interest. So praising the European Central Bank for negative rates. Okay, now notice, notice uh, that I got into a minor controversy here for uh, saying something nice about uh, this, this tweet by President Trump. and. Uh, and I said, uh, you know, Trump's support is important because if, suppose, suppose that the Democrats mostly understood the case for negative rates, the Republicans have historically been more, more hawkish, more in favor of higher interest rates generally. Uh, and so if, if Trump's support for negative rates can bring around some Republicans, now you've got, uh, a majority of Congress willing to go along with negative rates. Uh, okay, that's a, a bit about the political problem, but let me combine a solution to the bit political problem and, and the bank profits problem. Okay, so the bank profits problem is really, really, really easy to solve because it's very easy you know, the, the Fed or other central bank has a lot of dealings with commercial banks. And it's very, very easy for, this, for the Fed or other central bank to be nice to the commercial banks in various ways that uh, make their profits better off, to basically throw them money. Let me just talk about one particular way. You know, suppose, that, uh, suppose that most reserves, or beyond a certain point, the uh, reserves we're earning minus 4% per year, and, uh, and, or, or the equivalent of reserves. We'll, we'll talk about an equivalent of, 
a reserve account, an economic equivalent of a reserve account in a minute. But, you know, uh, reserves are the moral equivalent of reserves beyond a certain point or minus 4%. But if there's a certain amount of reserves that can, doesn't, isn't charged the minus 4%, uh, but has a zero interest rate, then, uh, then the bank's profits are higher than if it's having to pay the Fed for the entire amount that it has in the reserves. So by letting banks have some amount of reserves that are not subject to negative interest rates, central banks can help banks remain profitable. Now, what I would recommend, and this is the next big step in negative interest rate policy in my view, because it's, it's reasonably plausible that a central bank might do this. Um, I'd like to have the amount that banks can have in reserves that earns a zero or positive rate be tied to the amount of small household deposits a bank has. Uh, you know, deposits meaning checking accounts and savings accounts and things like that. If, if the Fed did this, then banks would be incentivized to not have negative rates for small household deposit accounts. Now, already they don't want to do this, but not only would it give them the incentive, because the more small accounts they had, the more, the more they get this above market rate, like market rates minus 4%, zero is above minus 4%. So the, the, if, if, the more, if you make it so the more small accounts they have, the, uh, uh, the, the more money they have in small accounts, the, the more they can get zero on instead of minus 4%, then they're going to want more small accounts. And so they'll be happy to give a zero interest rate on those small accounts or, or you know, give a better deal on those small accounts. And, um, you know, maybe they'd have some fees, but they could basically be okay with zero in them. And, uh, and, and you know, the banks want to do that anyway, because they think it would anger their customers to go to negative rates. So the banks are already inclined to do that. So I don't have any doubt that they do that if they're incentivized in this way, and they would be able to afford it because of this, you know, profit support from the Fed. Um, then you wouldn't have negative rates on small accounts. And so you've not only you've solved the bank profits account problem because that is why they have a bank profits problem. And I think for businesses or for folks who have huge amounts of money in the bank, which is a little strange, but there are some people who have huge amounts of money in checkings and savings accounts. I think that the banks could get away with having negative rates on them. They say, look, you can have zero up to this amount, but beyond that, I'm sorry, you know, Fed's charging us, we're going to have to charge you. I think they could explain that to people who had a million dollars in their checking account. Very weird thing to have a million dollars in the checking account, but some people do it. Okay, but notice not only does this support bank profits, it avoids the biggest political danger to the central bank from negative rates. The biggest political danger is news stories about regular people getting negative rates in their, in their bank deposit accounts, their checking accounts and savings accounts. You do not want those news articles. You know, if you can explain, oh, it's only when people have, you know, a large amount of money, fine. But if you have a lot of regular people who sound relatively poor getting negative interest rates in their checking account, I promise you that will sound very bad for the central bank. You don't want those news stories and you can avoid them with this policy. And I should say, you know, the central banks have such complicated formulas for, oh, you can have this amount of reserves at this rate, and this amount at this rate, and this amount at this rate. This would not be an unusual policy if they did it. Um, and, and, you know, you can have voluntary reporting because the banks don't get the subsidy. They don't get the benefit from the central bank unless they report it. And you can have the reporting tied to social security numbers, which again are voluntarily given. So people can't do double dipping and, you know, have a small amount in a bunch of different banks. It, it, this is quite doable bureaucratically. Okay, now I have this slide just to say, uh, my, uh, my work on negative interest rate policy has gotten some attention. So uh, in particular, uh, uh, some papers that I've done with Ruchir Agarwal, who's, uh, who's at the International Monetary Fund, uh, 
have, have drawn attention. So here's an article in the Financial Times that, uh, that is uh, speaking, speaking highly of this plan. Okay, now let's, we've talked about the political problem and the, uh, and the bank profits problem. Uh, those are kind of the most immediate problems, but as, as you go down to lower rates, you face at some point a paper currency problem. No one knows how low rates would have to go before people would start storing a lot of paper currency. What we do know is that at minus three quarters of a percent, there isn't a, a huge amount of paper currency storage. You know, it might have to do with some other wise policies that the Swiss National Bank is doing, for example. But, but anyway, if you, if, if you do some of the thing, you know, at, at any rate, Switzerland doesn't have a big problem of paper currency storage. I'm not saying nobody is storing paper currency, but it's not a huge amount. Okay, so here's how I propose, and, and you know, again, this is something I've written about in these papers with Ruchira Garwal. Here, here's, oh, sorry, I got to talk about what the paper currency problem is before resolving it. But actually, as I go through this, you should think about what some possible solutions are. Basically, you have to get in the way of what I'm talking about here. So the paper currency problem arises from the following. The following scheme can earn a zero interest rate minus storage costs. And okay, you got to be a bank that has dealings with the Fed. You, but you start out by exchanging some reserves dollar for dollar for paper currency. And at what I call the cash window of the Fed, it's, it's called by various names, but often like in the basement of a regional Federal Reserve Bank, they'll have a place where uh, banks can get out cash if they need more paper currency. But anyway, the, so the bank takes out cash and of course it gets debited in its reserve account um, at, at, at this cash window at the regional Fed. And then you store the paper currency and then maybe a couple of years later, you come back and you exchange the paper currency dollar for dollar for reserves. So you've turned each dollar into one dollar minus whatever the storage costs are. Now, you know, to do this directly, you need to be a bank that has access to the cash window, but you know, banks would happily do this for someone else, making them pay a little bit of a fee. So, you know, after storage costs and a bit of a fee to the bank that deals with the cash window of the, at the Fed, uh, you know, anybody could get that, uh, or so goes the argument. That, you know, and, and who knows what that is, but let's suppose that the storage costs are such that you could earn minus one and a quarter percent or something like that. Then if everybody can earn minus one and a quarter percent by doing this, then uh, there's no way that anybody would lend at minus four uh, percent. You know, nobody would, nobody would le lend at minus four percent. And so you just wouldn't have a market rate of minus four percent. And this could lead to inadequate aggregate demand. Uh, now, for this to happen, and to prevent minus 4%, you actually need a huge amount of paper currency stored. In fact, uh, you know, the only way you stop minus 4% from happening and stop the extra aggregate demand is if, if literally you're, you're pretty much turning the entire national debt, that's about $20 trillion, into paper currency and storing it. So we're not talking about storing a little bit of paper currency. We're not talking about storing $1 trillion of paper currency. We're talking about storing $20 trillion worth of paper currency. But if you get into a situation where people are storing $20 trillion worth of paper currency, then you know, you're gonna have an interest rate no lower than like minus one and a quarter percent. Okay, I talked about the cash window. Let me just make sure you know what it is. To meet the demand of its customers, banks get cash from the central bank by using the central bank's cash window. Uh, they, in, in the US, most banks maintain reserve accounts at the Federal Reserve. These banks can receive paper currency in exchange for electronic currency. And electronic currency is just a fancy name for reserves here by asking the Fed to debit their reserve account. 
you know, there might be private forms of electronic money, but the electronic um, monetary base is the reserves. Uh, banks also deposit cash at the cash window and are credited for those deposits in their reserve accounts. Okay, so what's my proposal here for taking care of paper currency, the paper currency problem? It's, uh, I call it an electronic money policy because it makes the electronic dollar the linchpin of the system. What's the electronic dollar? We use these all the time. It's just a dollar in the bank. I call it an electronic dollar because it's, it's just a dollar that's a number in some computer. Uh, so there's private electronic dollars in, uh, in, the, in the banking system and there's uh, government electronic dollars, namely reserves. But, but in any case, there are a lot of electronic dollars. Um, it, you're basically paying with electronic dollars if you pay with a credit card or a debit card or a check. It's only if you pay with paper currency that you're not using electronic dollars. Anytime you do a transaction, that's not with paper currency, you're using electronic dollars. Uh, so we use electronic dollars all the time in that sense. I mean, electronic dollars are the same thing as bank dollars, dollars in the bank. Okay. Uh, it, it, and so, you know, people think of the paper dollar as the centerpiece of our monetary system. This is kind of switching that around and saying, look, let's make the electronic dollar the linchpin of the system and the paper dollar is in a secondary role. So the basic idea is to combine uh, creating a negative paper currency interest rate or to make it so that people kind of lose money on holding paper currency by having a time varying deposit fee of the cash window, I will explain more, and using electronic money as the unit of account, you ideally want as many prices as possible set in terms of the electronic dollar now, my view is it's not terribly hard to have a lot of prices set in terms of the electronic dollar because anytime the transactions are done in an electronic way, anytime the transactions are done with checks or credit cards or, uh, or things like that, it's pretty natural to uh, set the prices in terms of the electronic dollars that are used in the typical transaction. And it's only when a typical, it's only in areas where transactions usually use paper currency or a very large share of the time use paper currency that you'd even be tempted to set prices in terms of paper dollars. Okay, so I do have to explain, but the idea is, you know, a paper dollar isn't going to be worth the same amount as an electronic dollar coming up. Okay, uh, so this electronic money policy is equivalent to an exchange rate at the cash window. You know, it's not a dollar, you know, one paper dollar is gonna be worth less than an electronic dollar. Like a paper dollar might be worth 98 electronic cents. So I call, it, I, I say that's like an exchange rate at the cash window. We're trying to get something that's very much like the current monetary system, but has no paper currency problem. So we're not trying to change everything in sight I'm trying to have as small a change as I can that'll make it so that uh, we can have deep, deep negative rates if we need to, to get aggregate demand to what it has, what it should be. So we don't have any extra regulations or quantity constraints. People can use as much paper currency as they want. We're not banning paper currency. We're, we're not putting any limits on how much paper currency people can have. Uh, we just have an exchange rate with paper currency. One nice thing about this kind of policy is that if you do just a little bit of it, people will hardly even notice. Uh, so, you know, if you had, um, you know, suppose you had minus five basis points for two years, then it's like a tenth of a percent. So when banks came in, in terms of a deposit fee, after two years, if banks came in to deposit a thousand dollars, then they'd be credited with $999 in their reserve account. You know, that tenth, one tenth of 1% is not gonna totally change everything in the economy. You know, if you use a small dose, it's not gonna change everything. Now, on the other hand, maybe you need a lot of extra aggregate demand, then you need a big dose, and getting the paper currency out of the way means you can have a very big dose of negative rates, minus 4%, minus 7% if you need it, 
if you really needed minus 10%, you can do that too. Uh, you know, maybe that's never ever needed. So you never go to minus 10%, but you could if you needed to. Okay, now this is a bit of a hard slide, but there is a formula from finance. Some of you have taken finance classes or will take finance classes. And you'll learn that the rate of return is equal to the dividend price ratio, say on a stock, is equal to the dividend price ratio plus capital gains, that is the, you know, how, how much the price goes up. Uh, so anyway, this is, uh, if, if you haven't ever learned this, don't stress over it too much. But uh, the point is there, there is, historically, uh, Silvio Gazelle wanted to make people put little stamps on the paper currency to have it continue to be worth its full value. And those little stamps were like a bit of tax on the paper currency. That's like having a negative dividend here. That's not the proposal here. The proposal here is to affect the rate of return on paper currency by having its price change. If the price is going down, that's a capital loss, and that gives you a negative rate of return. Okay. So, and so anyway, capital gains, and that's more like a guy named Robert Eisler. So these are, guy, you know, Silvio Gazelle was uh, there early in the 20th century. Robert Eisler wrote a book in like 1932. Um, we're going to use, create an exchange rate at the cash window using a time bearing deposit fee. Finally, I'm going to explain how this works. Here we have um, an alternate history. You know, there's a nice genre of science fiction where, where you think, what if, you know, what would have happened if, uh, um, you know, if uh, Hannibal had beaten, uh, had, had beaten the Romans? You know, I, of course, even on, uh, there, there's a TV series called Man in the High Castle that's like, what if, what if, uh, Hitler had won in World War II, what would have happened? Well, uh, here's an alternate history, much, much brighter than, uh, actually brighter than the history we actually had instead of darker. So suppose that you'd said, wow, in 2009, instead of the zero rates we actually had, we should have had the, the Fed's target rate minus 2%. And then suppose we had a quicker economic recovery so that by 2011, we could go to zero and then we could go up to 2% in 2012 through 2015. Now, one interesting thing about this is, you know, what actually happened is rates were basically zero in all of these years. If you add up these rates, this is better for savers than what actually happened. Uh, you know, even if you're a saver and we say savers are hurt by low rates, but in fact, you have lower rates for two years, minus 2% instead of zero, but because you get economic recovery, you can have higher rates after that. That's better than zero throughout this period. But anyway, suppose this is the, these are the rates you wanted. What about that paper currency problem? Well, let's think what people, let's think of the comparison between paper currency and keeping your money in, a reserve account, or let's assume treasury bills earn about the same as reserves. So if it's minus 2%, then $100 in a reserve account would become 98, then 96, because minus 2% in this year too. And then at zero, it would stay at 96, and at 2%, it would go up to 98, 100, and 102. Okay, our aim is to make it so that paper currency uh, earns the same. So let's take a look at how we do it. Take a $100 bill. It continues to say $100 throughout this period of time. So uh, its face value remains 100. Nothing physically has changed at all. You can use exactly the same green piece of paper that uh, we have now. Uh, but you want to have this minus 2% rate of return. How do you do that? Well, you say, well, a paper dollar starts out as, you, as we're used to worth one electronic dollar, but after a year, a paper dollar is worth only 98 cents. How do we do this? We say, well, if you deposit a, a one, one paper dollar at the cash window, we charge you a 2% deposit fee, 
So if you, if you deposit one paper dollar, we're only going to credit you with 98 cents. On the other hand, if you want to withdraw a paper dollar, we're only going to charge you 98 cents. So, you know, in both directions, we're going to treat, you know, we're, we're, we're going to exchange one paper dollar for 98 electronic cents. Oh, we could call it a deposit fee and a refundable defo- deposit fee, but it's economically equivalent to an exchange rate that makes one paper dollar equal to 98 cents. Okay, so look, your paper dollar that was worth one electronic dollar now is only worth 98 electronic cents. You've lost 2% of the value in nominal terms on this paper dollar because I'm going to think of nominal as measured by the electronic dollar. I mean, you can think about it in the other way, but this is the easiest direction to come at. Uh, Then, you know, after another year, minus 2% again, how do we get that to happen? We say after another year, gradually, gradually over this time, but after another year, uh, paper dollars worth 96 electronic cents and worth 96, 98, one. And notice your 100 paper dollars, if you measure their value in electronic dollars to compare them to up here, you get 100, 98, 96, 96, 98, 100. Notice it's identical here. Now, things don't change until you get over here where you say, okay, we're, we're gonna, not going to have the paper dollar worth more than the electronic dollar. We'll just stop here because we want to go back to usual where $1 paper is worth $1 electronic. So we say, okay, we'll go, we'll have the paper dollar worth a, a lower amount, but we'll never have a paper dollar worth more. So this is actually a very familiar situation where electronic dollars in a reserve account, say, or in treasury bills are earning more than paper dollars. Okay, so, you know, you might say that's not fair, but it's something that we're very used to. So we know that nothing terrible, nothing really terrible happens when you're in this situation. So anyway, notice there's no way to get ahead by storing paper currency because, you know, you could have gotten $96 worth in your reserve account just by keeping it in the reserve account. You, you have the option of getting $96 worth by the paper currency, but that's before paying for storage costs. There's nothing particularly attractive about this. I mean, it's okay, but it's not particularly attractive. So anyway, if you study this slide, I, I hope you'll be able to convince yourself that um, you can't uh, store paper currency and earn a higher rate of return than just by leaving it in the reserve account. So that takes care of the paper currency problem. There's just no incentive to store paper currency. Now, one of the nice things about this proposal is that people who already have paper currency, a lot of paper currency, are also in the same boat. You know, think of a drug lord that has a big stash of cash. Well, their cash is also going to be subject to this negative interest rate. So it's not like anybody out there is immune if they have a lot of cash. And let's let's face it, you know. Most regular people don't have huge amounts of cash, so it's kind of nice to be tax into. It's kind of nice to be charging negative interest rates to the 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 unsavory folks who do have huge huge amounts of cash. I'm not saying there there are a few really nice people who have huge amounts of cash, but it's relatively rare. Uh, the typical person who has millions of dollars in cash uh, is not someone you want to hang around with. And again, there are exceptions, but I don't know any. All right. So uh, now I, I talked about this exchange rate. Uh, one, one interesting thing to point out is we're talking about an exchange rate between paper currency and electronic dollars. And that's what's important for negative interest rate policy to solve the paper currency problem. But we're very used to the central bank at the cash window setting exchange rates between different forms of money. For example, two $10 bills are worth one $20 bill. Uh, You know, 10 $10 bills are worth a $100 bill. And that's not because of the numbers written on them. I promise you, if the Fed tomorrow said, okay, if you you give us a $100 bill, we'll only give you $99 of smaller bills worth and if you give us $99 of smaller bills, we'll give you a $100 bill. If the Fed said that, and they also said, you know, depositing it into reserves 
will credit you with $99. That $100 bill that says 100 on it, I promise you it wouldn't be worth $100. It would be worth $99. It's not the numbers written on these green pieces of paper that gives you their value. It's how they're treated at the cash window. Therefore, in the same way, uh, you know, if all paper currency is treated as being worth a different amount than, uh, it, than, than its face value in terms of electronic dollars, it's, it's not worth its face value. Um, and, and notice we're, we're mostly talking about small percentage changes. You know, if you needed really, really deep negative rates for a long time, you might get big percentage differences. But, you know, I, it would, I don't think you're going to need that. You know, minus 7% for one year is super, super powerful monetary policy. It's, it's hard to think of a, a shock to the economy. Uh, even the one we're in, where, you know, once you solve the medical and public health problem, I can't imagine us being in a situation where, you know, minus 7% wouldn't give us, for one year, wouldn't give us aggregate, ag aggregate demand. So, you know, and minus 7% for one year would mean that a uh, paper dollar was worth 93, 93 electronic cents. Okay. Anyway, the point is, uh, central banks have, you know, if they can make, they can make as, just create electronic dollars out of thin air. They also have the authority to give out as much paper currency as they want, and they let people exchange that. If you have the unlimited ability to create two types of money, you can set the exchange rate between those two types of money. Uh, you know, both of these things are within your power. You can, you can create the exchange rate. We're very used to that with like two $10 bills equaling two $20 bills. Why is that true? It's because the Fed can make as many $10 bills as it wants. Actually, it asks the mint to physically create them, but then it has them in its vaults and is allowed to give them out as much as it wants. So. The mint, I, the mint will make as many ten and twenty dollar bills as the Fed asked it to, and uh, and so uh, given that uh, the Fed sets the exchange rate, and the Fed has decided that two ten dollar bills are worth one twenty dollar bill. Very logical thing to decide, but nevertheless they've decided it, and if they decided something different, the exchange rate would be different. Okay, so. The bottom line here is the Fed can set the exchange rate or the effective exchange rate between paper currency and electronic dollars so that they can do this. And if they do this, there's just no point in storing huge quantities of paper currency, which was the thing we were worried about. And, and, and again, you know, it's like if somebody doesn't understand this scheme and stores a bit of uh, paper currency, fine, you know. What we're trying to avoid is people storing trillions of dollars worth of paper currency. Okay. Uh, okay, now, um, one of the most exciting things for me lately has been working with um, Dave Wishnick on negative interest rate law. So we're, we're working on paper that we intend to try to put in a, um, in, in, a, in a law journal. Now, why is negative interest rate law important? It's important because the political problem is sufficiently big that I think it would be difficult to let, get legislation through that explicitly authorized negative interest rates and changes to paper currency policy. I, I'm not at all banking on legislation that explicitly says, oh, the Fed can do all these things that I talked about. So therefore, it's quite important to know whether the Fed under existing authority can use negative rates and change paper currency policy. Now, you know, obviously Congress could, you know, pass, try to pass a law and if it wasn't vetoed or they had overrode the president, they could have legislation that clipped the Fed's wings and, uh, you know, reduce the Fed's current powers. But, you know, it's actually not that easy to pass legislation 
in the United States. There's, there's a lot of ways to block new legislation. And, uh, you know, one House of Congress can block it. The president can usually block new legislation. You know, so it's, uh, you know, there are lots of ways for individual senators and Congress people to slow down legislation. So, so I'm, the way I'm coming at it is imagining a situation where you can't get new legislation passed to increase the Fed's authority, but you also can stop legislation that would reduce the Fed's power. The question then is under current law, what can the Fed do in terms of negative interest rates? Okay, so some, some people argue in the text of the law that the Fed can't have negative interest rates on reserves, but the Fed doesn't need interest rates on the reserves. Here's an alternative that's legally different, but economically just as good as negative interest rates on reserves. What the Fed can do is, uh, already the Fed has reserve requirements that have minimum reserves. What if they also have a maximum amount of reserves? So it's like, I mean, you could get all tech, you can get into the technical details. I mean, it's like during the day, banks could have as much reserves as they want, but at night there's a maximum amount of reserves that they could have. And you say, what in the world are the banks going to do with those trillions of dollars worth of money uh, uh, of, of reserves that they have during the day? Well, you say, hey, you can, uh, you can basically lend them to the Fed at a negative interest rate. And, uh, you know, the typical way such lending would be done would be with, with uh, treasury bills as collateral. So you don't need to know all the details there, but you have some used treasury bills as collateral, but basically you say, well, you can lend in this other way and you, know, you can't lend to the Fed more than a certain amount in reserves, but you can lend to the Fed in this other way with treasury bills as collateral. And uh, that can have any interest rate. So that's not a reserve account. So it's not subject to, if, if not, not everybody agrees on what the law says, but if, if you do read the law to say you can't negative, have negative interest rates on reserves, there's nothing in that law that says you can't have negative interest rates lending against treasury bills, which is different from reserves. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, so anyway, just by having the cap on reserves and, uh, you know, then allowing the banks to lend at negative interest rates beyond that cap, you get the same economic effect as if you'd had a negative interest on reserves. In fact, the other thing that you've done is it's, it's equivalent to negative interest rates on reserves on the last dollar, but notice you effectively have a certain amount that's at a zero rate. Uh, you know, what's in the reserve account technically is at a zero rate and what's kind of economically a lot like reserves, but is, but is you know, lending against treasury bills is, um, is instead at a, at, a, at a negative rate. So it's like that, you know, it's really, you know, because the last dollar is a negative rate, is at a negative rate, banks would still be willing to lend at a low interest rate to kind of avoid having to have lots of, uh, you know, lots of funds that are earning this negative rate. Uh, so they'd still be willing to lend at a low rate, even though there's a certain amount that they're getting a zero interest rate on. It's, it's what rate they're getting on the last dollar, the, the marginal, the interest rate on the marginal dollar that matters. Okay, now here's a tiny note here, which isn't super relevant to these things up here, but I, I want you to understand that, you know, the Fed would still be doing open market operations. It would be buying and selling treasury bills. Uh, remember how it works. They need, to, they need to have a big enough monetary base so that you're on the flat part of that demand for the monetary base where the interest rate is basically determined by the interest on reserves. Uh, and I said, say interest on reserves, but now it's this interest rate on this overnight facility of lending against treasury bills. Um, and, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, the Fed would still need to be buying treasury bills. And what does it look like to have, say, a minus 4% rate on treasury bills? Well, that's like 
you know, if the face value of a treasury bill is a thousand dollars, that's like the Fed paying, uh, you know, a thousand and ten dollars or one percent above face value. One percent above face value, the treasury bill pays off as face value three months later. So if the Fed is paying that much for treasury bills, they're losing 1% of their value in three months. If they lose 1% of their value in three months, that's 4% lost value in nominal terms in a year. So, so anyway, just paying high prices for treasury bills is a negative rate on those treasury bills. And uh, the Fed would be doing some of that, but it needs to have an interest rate in this overnight facility that's kind of a substitute for reserves it's also at minus 4%. Now, what about the changes to paper currency? Well, legally, there are two arguments that the Fed can change how paper currency is handled at the cash window. The first is simply that the Fed has great authority over the reserve accounts it provides. It ought to be able to impose conditions on depositing paper currency in a reserve account. It's not like, it's not like, commercial banks have some absolute right to be able to deposit whatever they want into the reserve account if the Fed says, look, okay, you can deposit that much, no problem. But if you want to deposit more paper currency than that, for example, you're going to have to pay a deposit fee. Uh, probably that could stand up in court. And quite honestly, it's not that easy to sue the Fed. The courts are not that sympathetic to folks wanting to sue the Fed. Sometimes they, they do it. Uh, sometimes they're not thrown out of court. But, you know, to have what's called legally standing, to have the right to sue the Fed is a tougher thing than you might think. Uh, the other, so, so anyway, the Fed being lord over its reserves accounts is one argument because this is just a deposit fee for depositing paper currency into the reserve account. Um, you know, a, dep a deposit fee is equivalent to an exchange rate, but for legal purposes, calling it a deposit fee seems like a good idea. The other argument that the Fed could change paper currency policy in the way that I talked about is that the Fed is allowed in, in law to charge fees commensurate with the costs it incurs in dealing with paper currency. Now, there's no question that the people who wrote the law had in mind things like the Brinks trucks that are transporting paper currency and the Fed can, you know, charge a fee for that. But, uh, but um, the law actually refers to fees a little bit more generally than that. And the argument here is, you know, suppose you're, you're earning a higher interest rate in effect by storing paper currency, uh, you know, taking out paper currency from the cash window, storing it, putting it back in, than you'd earn in uh, the overnight facility with the, where you're lending to the Fed uh, and, and it's giving you treasury bills as collateral. The, um, that, that's called an arbitrage profit if you're kind of borrowing at a low rate and then, then earning a higher rate. So if you're earning a higher rate on paper currency than the going interest rate, uh, you know, it's like you're earning these arbitrage profits. Where are they coming from? You know, you say, oh, from the money tree. Uh, but what is the money tree here? The money tree here is the Fed. Every bit of arbitrage profit is at the expense of the Fed's net worth and so is a genuine cost to the Fed. You know, paper currency arbitrage profits don't come out of nowhere. They come out of the hide of the Fed financially. And because they're coming out of the Fed's hide, the, the law that says it can charge you know, I would argue the law that says it can charge fees and commensurate with its costs comes into action. It's like, it's really costing us to let you use the paper, to, the, the cash window in this way. So we can, we can charge you an appropriate fee for that cost to us. So anyway, those are the two arguments. These are, this is still something we're working on, but, uh, so this is more a teaser than the real thing, but, uh, but I thought you might be interested. Okay, now one, one thing you might say is, wow, this is a huge change. Can we change things this, in this big a way? I just wanna remind you a bit of the history of the monetary system. Just in the US, we've changed major, major things about every 50 years. You know, we, we, uh, back in the middle of the 19th century, we had a gold and silver standard. And then uh, in 1873, 
we uh, went to just a gold standard. William Jennings Bryan in his Cross of Gold speech called this the, the uh, crime of 1873. Then, um, you know, then we had a gold standard for a long time. The gold standard weakened somewhat, especially uh, FDR was, well, the best thing that FDR did to get us out of the Great Depression was to weaken the gold standard in the US. And uh, he really did a lot towards that. So that's where he gets the most credit. You know, the stuff that you probably learned in the history about what Franklin Delano Roosevelt did to get us out of the Great Depression, that's not the important stuff. The important stuff was weakening the gold standard. That's the big thing FDR did and what he deserves a lot of credit for. The other stuff was minor in comparison and in terms of getting us out of the Great Depression. Okay. So then uh, the gold standard was somewhat weakened, but we had fixed exchange rates. That means, you know, certain number of pounds per dollar, certain, the euro didn't exist, but certain number of pounds per dollar, certain number of pesos per dollar. But then one day in 1971, Nixon woke up and he said, ah, I don't want to have fixed exchange rates anymore. And over the course of about a year, Nixon blew up the fixed exchange rate system. Um, then, you know, we actually do have negative interest rates uh, without any big change to, to paper currency policy now in many countries. So things are shifting. And, and then let me jump over for a minute uh, this, what I've got in blue. Some people talk about a cashless economy, no paper currency in the system that could work, but that's not what I'm talking about. Let's say that's down the road. I say maybe 2045 or something. The beauty of the electronic money system I'm talking about is you could do it tomorrow. You could do it tomorrow. It's just an instruction to the cash window. So you can use the same physical pieces of paper, you know, getting to where people don't need to use cash at all. You know, there's some serious adjustments there, but having a, an exchange rate slightly different from one to one, eh, that, that people could adjust. And certainly the, uh, the, the Fed or other central bank can implement it very quickly because as long as the folks who run the cash window will obey uh, Jerome Powell or whoever else is, or, or the, you know, the um, uh, Federal Open Market Committee, then uh, it's, it's there. It's bureaucratically very easy. Send down a spreadsheet to the cash window for what the, uh, what the paper currency deposit fee is, give them a few other instructions like that it's refundable, you're there. Okay, uh, now you might say, oh wow, this will never happen, but it, it's come a long way from where we started. You know, here's a bit of history. We have mild negative rates. Uh, there was a 2015 London conference on removing the zero lower bound on interest rates. Um, Say next day there was the chief economist workshop where where uh, Ken Rogoff and I gave gave talks on negative interest rates. Uh, you know the Bank of England chief economist at the time gave a speech in favor of negative interest rates. Ben Bernanke, uh, after his time at the head of the Fed, has had blog posts in favor of negative interest rates. There's a Brookings conference. Uh, there was a talk at the famous Jackson Hole conference. Uh, of, of, about monetary policy. Uh, Ken Rogoff published a book, The Curse of Cash, where he talks about the electronic money system that, I, that he talks about. With, he talks about what I was recommending using my name. And uh, then, uh, you know, Marvin Goodfriend, who is a negative interest rate advocate, was nominated to the Federal Reserve Board. Unfortunately, he, he died last year. Well, I mean, he also didn't get through onto the board, but even more unfortunately, he died last year, way before the coronavirus. And uh, and I, I I think of the, uh, President Trump tweeting in favor of negative interest rates as an important milestone as well. And because of this coronavirus, you know, a year down the road, there might be more big milestones for negative rates. We'll see. And you know, here's just a list of people who are, who have said things that are favorable towards negative interest rates, including the possibility of changing paper currency policy, uh, most of them. 
are in that latter category. And, uh, and so I mentioned a couple of papers I wrote with Ruchira Agarwal. Here are their names, Breaking Through the Zero Lower Bound, Enabling Deep Negative Rates, a guide. These are actually, it's Enabling Deep Negative Rates to Fight Recessions, a guide. Uh, these are both IMF working papers. Now that I need to update this, it's now an official IMF working paper like the earlier one is. And I have a published paper, Negative Interest Rate Policy is Conventional Monetary Policy. And on my blog, I have links to pretty much everything I've written about negative interest rate policy. And among those many things I've written about negative interest rate policy, I've even got a children's book. So you can, you can find that there on, uh, on this uh, bibliographic post. You'll be able to find that uh, gather around children is uh, here's how to heal a wounded economy. So take a look at that. And uh, thanks for thanks for listening. That's uh, that's that's it for now. And you are now officially, if you've if you've watched um, this and and um, the the one on uh, on percentage changes and things that are measured in percent, uh, plus everything that came before that, you're now uh, you're now basically prepared to do the practice exam. So good luck with that and, and stay safe.